الحضور الكريم الآن مع كلمة رئيسية بعنوان كيف تسهم تقنيات الواقع المعزز في استكشاف مستقبل التنوع البيولوجي؟ تقدمها سارة دافانزو رئيس قطاع تجربة العملاء في مؤسسة بيير فابر Dear guests, now a keynote titled How an Augmented Scientist Discovers the Future of Green Science by Sara Devanzo, Chief Consumer Engagement and Activation Officer of Pierre Fabre Foundation. Please remain seated. Hello. If we get settled, I'll begin. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to begin. So today, I'm going to share with you three pieces of research. And Let's start with the first piece of research. It's what I call the future of foresight through the history of alchemy. And the story goes, I was in the gold industry for 10 years. I'm sure you couldn't figure that one out. So I was in the gold industry in South Africa. I was the lead strategist after apartheid to actually design the strategy for the South African gold industry, which involved figuring out what's the future of medicine, the future of technology, the future of fashion, the future of money, and obviously with that, you have gold futures. So I was thrown into the foresight and futures world through that experience. And that was many, many decades ago, actually, believe it or not. So that was in 1998 after apartheid. And what I ended up doing was a global piece of research on the future of gold around the world. And what you see here is actually the cover of the Alchemist magazine is, the, is actually the magazine for the London Bullion Market Association. And on the cover is actually an image from the Gold of Africa Museum, which I helped build. And in that process, I became pretty familiar with alchemy. So it was constantly rubbing up stories about alchemists and the magic of gold and the allure of gold. And I think it's a really perfect metaphor for what we do in the world of foresight. So specifically, the processes of alchemy, it's actually a lot like design thinking, very similar. There's a lot of synthesis of all kinds of material, and then you consolidate it, and you ferment it, or you smelt it, and then you break it apart, and it's this back and forth of construction and deconstruction, which is a classic alchemical process. And so it's kind of what we do in foresight, right? We're taking signals, and we're trying to cluster them and break them apart, and so forth. But one thing that's important is that I learned from the work was that alchemy was not necessarily about making gold or finding gold. It was actually, it's, a, it's, a, it's an art about transformation. And that's what we do for a living. We transform thinking and we transform the world around us. So I think it's a pretty interesting metaphor for what we do. And specifically, a little side story. So while I was in the industry, we had an idea of how let's, let's change the mindset and the mental models of gold. How about we make something that's not gold? It's blue, it's purple, it's green. So we came up with this idea, let's create green gold with an alloy. And why don't we actually take the mine dumps of South Africa, where I used to live very near here in Johannesburg, and actually cover them with a plant that actually absorbs the gold from the, from the soil. It's an actually more of an ecological way of reclaiming gold. You and then harvest the plant in, and you can then reclaim the gold. And so that was considered a crazy idea. Okay, I will come back to this in 20 minutes. So back to gold. Gold is always perceived in the top of the pyramid of enlightenment. It's associated with insight and enlightenment. We've got our facts and data. For a period of my career, I was a chief data officer. So I'm in the world of data science. I consider myself a quantitative futurist or foresight practitioner. And so we're looking for wisdom or 
foresight, foreseeing, right? But what I find really interesting is take this metaphor of gold and now look at it as by mining gold. You spend so much energy finding just a little bit of uh, so much ore, tons of ore to get one gram of gold. And this is very similar to the work that we do in foresight, right? There's so much effort that goes into the nuggets of foresight that we would use as a, in our work, our strategy. And then the value system. So you have different roles. We were speaking on a panel this morning about the roles in foresight, about miners, refiners, minters, crafters. The value in the gold industry is after the work is crafted. That's where the magic is. So it's not enough to just read signals and take the data. We have to craft narrative in the work that we do. And OK, we're curious people. I think the one thing for sure that connects all of us is research that I've been doing over actually two decades now on the, the traits or qualities of futurists. We're curious. We're very curious people, which is lovely. And my research also found that, believe it or not, you feel cu curiosity in, in the future in the same part of your body. But that's neither here nor there. The point is, is that that led me, this idea of this incessant curiosity, to do a piece of research, which is the first piece of research I'm sharing with you, which was in looking at 155 insights professionals and 24 futurists and saying, OK, so what is the future of foresight? Just say open-ended. It was open-ended, qu a questionnaire, global, and 52,000 words came out of it. And as a result, I had to use five AI systems to be able to parse this data. Now, I've been working with AI and foresight for eight years. Happy to talk to you about this later on if you're interested in understanding how I've been using it. Um, but there's no way I would have been able to analyze 52,000 words without the help of foresight. And you can read the list. This was the takeaways from what the, the research. But I want to draw your attention to the AI human power, which is the bottom one. That's the point I want to let, leave, leave you on. So, AI, very controversial. There's a lot of conversation here today about should we be using AI? I do not believe it's going to replace what we do, but I do believe we ought to know how to work with it in partnership. And for me, there's no way I could do the work that I do without AI. Um, it helps me to parcel huge amounts of data. I'm sorry, I'm in meetings. I don't know about you, but I go to meetings, all a lot of meetings, and I don't work on the weekends necessarily, and I don't work 24 seven, but I can get the AI to do a lot of that boring, tedious scraping of signals and data crunching so that the humans can go in and actually then make sense of it. Right, but also the AI is helping us to really imagine these really interesting futures. Now, I think we're in an era, which I'll call the augmented futurist era. We're, 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 it's possible for us now to use these tools. We never had this kind of in, intelligence and, and, and assistance before. So let's use this concept of the augmented futurists. We're all augmented futurists. Now, in my company, PFAB, which is a leading life sciences company, I, we was, I work with scientists. So I do strategic foresight and informed sciences. And what we have is scientists are looking, that I'm dealing with, are looking to augment their thinking all the time. They're looking at ways to uh, uh, boost their bodies, to think differently, to think smarter, to have different connections. So let's take the, that example in our work of, of foresight. You know, we, we've got biosensors and biotech. There's all kinds of new developments. Obviously, the IoT. We've got neural dust that can read your brain signals and your blood system. So that we're collecting data in new places. And another thing is, is that we're seeing the invisible. So I'm able to see now the Wi-Fi patterns of people walking around the spaghetti trails. I'm able to see in night vision how people work in their houses and what, what they're doing in their private time, if they, of course, consent. But the point is, is that we have, <laughs> we have a, a, the ability. And the scientists I'm, I'm, I'm work with in the life sciences world are doing everything they can to, bo to boost their thinking. And some of them are looking at uh, uh, microbial transplants, uh, the benefits of, 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 believe it or not, of intermittent fasting, uh, boost your brain power, microdosing of drugs, uh, sensory deprivation, dark rooms. It's a big trend now to go to a dark room. Um, uh, cryotherapy and so forth. And then you've got all kinds of sensory amplification techniques that are being used to create new connections. It's really to help us think differently and to stimulate our thinking to come up with new insights. So as we go about this, back to this kind of ancient uh, allegory, the alchemists of old used equipment. They augmented themselves all the time with, with machinery, with, with all kinds of laboratory equipment, and they were actually taking psychotropic drugs to over 
every culture across the millennia were doing things to enhance their thinking in the alchemist way. So the conclusion of this first chapter, it's a crescendo, is gold is a metaphor. We can think about it. It's definitely in the world of modern alchemy, we have to think about mental alchemy. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. And then please leave with this idea of an augmented futurist. How are you becoming an augmented futurist? What are you doing to boost the way that you're in taking in information and moving forward? OK, second piece of research. The second piece of research is basically probing the future of nature. So this is a regenerative nature sector. So I did a piece of primary research to prepare for today, and also COP28. So the first thing is, I took the mind of being an augmented futurist. So I did a bunch of stuff that I put on those other slides. Okay, and then I attacked it. I attacked what is the future of Greek science and what's the future of regenerative nature. Those are the two topic areas. And went forward to un un unpack it. And one of the techniques was this idea of exotic data. So exotic data is actually, it's born from uh, intelligence, the intelligence community. I don't know how to say it any better, differently. Um, the intelligence community in Wall Street in the early 2000s were using advanced research to find insights. Um, I've had the fortune of doing work with the intelligence community and DARPA and learned about some of these techniques. And as a result, we've been able to evolve them today. And so we're, what we're doing is we're scraping those sensors. We're looking for biometrics. We're doing deep web, dark web sweat, scraping for insights and intelligence. So we did that. So we got a bunch of signals. And then what we did was we took that distillation process, right? Just followed the process just because it was fun. It was just more like fun. And then I partnered with an AI platform. So now being in the space of AI and foresight for a number of years, usually you're working in a government or it's a big data kind of assignment. This is one of the most uh, powerful tools that you can find, I, I found, that I could afford. I'm being very blunt. Um, and because of the fact that it, it, there's an accuracy that I've not seen before it, when I look at 12 months out. OK, so it's scraping signals from the deep web, the dark web, social, and so forth. But it's also got sci-fi and movie scripts. So there's qualitative literature that's also feeding into this platform. And so I said, OK, let's unpack the future of green science with this platform. Future of green science. Spoiler, it's not green. OK, so what ended up happening was there were five areas, five very strong clusters of, of territories, absolutely huge areas that, that we, we could not ignore them. And so the first area, which you're going to be very familiar with, circular economy. Everyone's aware of that in, in this room. But there's a lot of space in the circular economy. There's many, many topics. And for my job, in, it, with my business, is I got to figure out what to focus on. What is the priorities? So that's, that's part of it. So anything that helps to score or size so I can compare areas and territories is very helpful. So from this case, these are the five territories with the most momentum in the next year, one year. So that's all we can look at. But it's helping me at least say, OK, I need to focus on these topic areas very, very seriously. The second one is low fidelity, which really is kind of funky. It's just a, my way of saying it's basically unprocessed and simplicity. So these are the five areas within low fidelity that was a cluster about simplicity, traditional, unprocessed, clear, transparent, and so forth. Ethics. Not surprising. Ethics doesn't always come up in a conversation with around clean and sustainability. See my friend Philip over here from, from L'Oreal. I did work with L'Oreal for, I was leading Foresight there for a number of years. And the, in the work was looking at the future of clean. And ethics was not necessarily in that conversation. And so this is a, a great discovery to find out that there's this territory with a lot of a, a momentum. And what I mean by this is fair trade, human, mindfulness, inclusivity. That's a bucket. That's a very important bucket around this green space. Altruism. Altruism is health. So it's everything to do with non-toxicity. It has to do with long-term fortifying, non-toxic, gentle. And then finally, natural. And that's what's interesting, because that's what everyone always thinks about green. They think, oh, it's all natural. But yet there are four other dimensions that are just as important as natural. And when we talk about natural, it's not all natural. According to the signals, we're talking millions of signals, it's really plant, water-based, fungi-based, wild, and decay. So looking at things that are rotten. So now you say, wait a minute, is that, is that, is that, is that universally? No. 
That's what the power of AI is. I could never do this on my own. So we were able to compare these signals across countries and regionals, regions and globally. And this is important because I've worked in roles where are global roles and I need to understand what are the dynamics that we need to, we're a multinational corporation, the company I'm with right now is 120 countries. We have to be looking at signals of change and the future across all of those emerged and emerging markets and developed markets. And so importantly, what was fascinating was altruism or altruistic, which is all about healthfulness, is actually got the last three years is the strongest in the UAE. And then naturality is really the strongest in the United States. And that's critical to someone who's doing strategy for a corporation. Now when we look to the future, this is the next 12 months, not the past three years, you see this skew. And what do you see? You see a whole bunch of, whoa, that's crazy. It's a lot of action over here in the UAE because of COP28, obviously. It's been, and that's why we need humans to deal with the AI. Because if you just let the AI work on its own, you'd come to some incorrect conclusion that all of a sudden there's gonna be an explosion of these topics. So I'm just illustrating, that's why humans are involved in this. So when we dig deeper, we see that it's skewed because of COP28. Okay, what's the future of generative nature? That's the topic of this, the theme here. I'm not gonna go into the same detail. Now I'm gonna show you that, look, it's, gonna, it's expected to grow by 26% based on the AI. End of story. It's an American concept. Very importantly, it dissected where the signals are coming from, and what's important is that this is not natural language. As we go into COP28, average people are not using the word regenerative nature. This is not, a, a, this is not natural language, okay? So if we wanna actually be making impact and change, we have to be using language that the average person knows about. So just leaving it like that. But what I find interesting is what this does. So the machine is able to scrape, okay? So I did, I did a presentation at South by Southwest where I showed five experiments to show can AI with a foresight team look at the meta trends or is it better at the micro trends? And I'm just gonna tell you my personal experience doing this over the years is that it's really bad at the meta, okay? It's not good at coming across at trends. It comes up with topics like health or technology. That's not gonna give me anything that I can actually work with, right? But what it's really fascinating is being able to find and scrape the internet for the edges and look for clusters of areas that I wouldn't normally be on the day to day. So it pulls up these strange things. So I found in the regenerative nature, one of the clusters was the melding of animals, animal and plant life. And then when we dug deeper, we were like, oh yeah, there were some recent discoveries in recent years around this. And the, the great possibilities of what we could learn from the DNA of animal, plant, believe it or not, organisms. And then there was this area around flora and you know, plant life and, and AI hybrids. And then fauna, which is organism plus AI, you know, the xenobots that are making the news all over the place and several other, uh, other kinds of hybrids. We found that reverse cellular senescence was a big topic area. I was happy about that because that's one of the areas that my company pay, focuses on. We were a plant-based company, and so Pierre Fab is working very hard in this, but it's not really a, a language that people really understand. It's the idea is that we can stop aging in plants, we can figure out how to stop aging in humans, right? Um, artificial botany, synthetic botany, programmable fungi, designing smart plants. Ah, this is interesting. This is an example of how it finds weird stuff that there's no way I'm gonna find or my team is gonna find. So electroculture is a concept from over 100 years ago. It's basically you run electrical currents through your garden and it propagates growth, okay? It's having a moment. So when we saw this from the AI, we did some more social listing and we dug deeper and we found there's like communities on TikTok, there are in social media, there are hashtags. It's a space we would never have considered or understood unless this was surfaced by the AI. Of course, we had to double check it. And we found agroforestry, agro mixing of forest with a farm that for biodiversity is a trending concept. Soil regeneration, we all know about it because we're all talking about it for COP28. Intergenerative farming or ranching, which is long-term, it actually comes out of the Native American uh, farming practices. And then finally, this weird one. That's why I called it a positive deviant. <laughs> it's like, oh, well obviously, this surfaced from the AI system, because it's got the word regenerative in it, and it's a regenerative nature, so we were like, okay. But then we'll be like, hey, this is interesting because I'm a foresight strategist. Like I started in the gold industry. I do strategy. So I need help to do have strategic thinking. And this 
is a really interesting concept when we think about what would regenerative braking be like for an economy? What would it be like for a city? What would it be like for society? Sometimes we have to take the pedal off the gas, slow down to gain momentum. It becomes an interesting paradigm of how we might think about, as you go into COP28, what is it, where are the places that maybe we don't want to grow? In fact, we want to slow. So biomimicry, a lot of biomimicry. In my world, in the corporate world, having to sell into a board of directors or a publicly listed company, influencing people who might be very skeptical about foresight. Obviously, it's very data driven, and I run a quantitative foresight team because of that, because they want to see the numbers, they want to see the numbers. But when it comes to showing the, 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 the mental alchemy, that mental creativity of getting to imagine a future. So even if the data is saying, hey, it's going to be like this, it seems incredulous. If I can show an example from nature, it works. I tell you, it's been so successful in my career, finding examples in nature from biomimicry that actually ex ex exemplify what I'm trying to communicate, whether it's a colony of bees or whether it's some kind of plant. So I'm using, I'm just sharing that with you. That's a very important tactic in my world. So conclusion, green, think about clean, biotech. I mean, it's a little hyperbolic. It's not necessarily going to save us, but please lean into it. And think about this idea. I think it's super provocative. Be slow to grow. How can we use regenerative braking as a concept societally and potentially with our, uh, our, our, our work? Last and very short little chapter. Finding the future of wisdom today in our today's youth. Okay. So as you all know, we all look at the Gen Z, right? Okay. So I produced with my colleagues a report on Gen Z that was published in 2013 that is often credited with being the catalyst that created the moniker Gen Z. So it was very, I mean, it was actually put into our lexicon in the 1996, but it took off in 2013 after the publishing. It's got a couple, several millions of views online. Okay, it was cited in many, many, many media channels. And so this idea of Gen Z, we all know today it's 16 to 25, that kind of thing. Uh, okay, so since 2013, I've been doing research with Gen Z. Just in the past two years, I did 12 focus groups of Gen Z talking about the future, talking about their lives. And what's really interesting is that they talk about not regeneration. They talk about generation, meaning being generative. So regeneration, you know, take one, replace two. Why not just replace? Why not just generate? Okay, And that's a concept that's very, very, very Gen Z. And so I'd like to propose I have a little bit of liberty here that we rename them the regeneration. So in front of the Z generation is the regeneration because they use that language. That's their language and that's what connects with them. Now, as I wrap up, I have a little bit of a sad story, which is some recent research, because I did this for this, this talk, just to reconfirm what I knew, because I've been doing this for years, and I'm like, let's just see, if it, is, is it as bad as it was last year? OK, well, yeah, it is, because 83% of the Gen Zs that we surveyed, North America, mind you, all North America, were, have a very bleak outlook. But what's fascinating is some of, the, uh, the, some of the insights. Now, not surprising, climate change is the number one problem, Right? But it's this division and inequity that is really concerning because they don't think that we adults can fix it. Right? They're not having faith in us. And I look around the room, I don't see so many regenerations here. Okay, I'm just put, putting it out there. So we have some, some, some uh, other findings is that women are, seem to be more pessimistic, two times more than men. That's actually been reconfirmed from several pieces of research I've done. Men are, are not empowered. They, they feel they, they, they don't have agency, even more so than the women. Um, it doesn't seem to be regional, no matter the state, red states, blue states, nothing like that. But there was a direct correlation between pessimism and affluence which means, interesting, we should do this research because I wonder if emerging markets have my, a false sense of optimism, which is something to think about, and likewise religiosity also forgets some kind of optimism. So these kinds of findings are kind of interesting as we talk about the future. But when it boils down to, we say, what is the future like for the Gen Z, especially climate change, green science, regenerative nature? Did a piece of research where we put out some questions. So describe the future where we've started solving the, 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 the issues like climate change. So it's not fixed, it's starting. And just that little hope, just that little hope is enough to unlock 
all kinds of potential. And this is the imagery that was, that was generated by Dolly from the essays of the response to that question of the 250 Gen Zers that we interviewed. And what do you see? You see diversity, we see technology, we see tradition, we see inclusivity, we see urbanity, we see green energy. It's a beautiful vision. And that, to me, is not regenerative. That is generative. This is a gorgeous, thriving world that we're seeing that's imagined by the, from the language of these somewhat dark and pessimistic Gen Zers on the future. The second question we asked was, how will your generation help to address climate change? How will you? And so then they wrote little essays and little paragraphs about what is it. And again, we fed it into the AI. There's no way I could have done this without the AI. And these images popped up. And how they think that they're going to help is through education, world congresses like this, coming together, dialogue, right? Technology, for sure. Fascinating. Technology. This generation are augmented futurists. They are the natural augmented futurists. I spoke earlier that we must think of ourselves this way, but they're already this way. They're science influencers. They're on TikTok, Twitch. They're everywhere doing science experiments. That's where science is happening today. Working in a life sciences company, I'm paying attention because this is where science is happening at the grassroots level. And it's because they've been educated on STEM and they have the tools, they have the language, they have laboratories, they have fab labs. They are so sophisticated problem solvers. And their life choices are not linear. They're not making the same life choices that we're doing. There's no Maslow's hierarchy of needs because there's no up and down. It's all over the place. And think about that as we design alternative futures. It's always some kind of linear back, forward, up like that. It'd be great to have the circular thinking as we go into problem solving. So conclusion number three, Gen Z to regeneration. It's just a thought. Strive to thrive. Let's take that inspiration from those images, because those are generative images. Those were not just regenerative images, just replacing what we depleted. And we got to change the narrative. Change the narrative, because there's a lot of dystopian conversation. And that's the conclusion, my friend, because now I get back to this. So when I was laughed out of South Africa, I'm just, yeah, but it was, it was yeah, there's a great crazy gold, green gold, yeah, the, uh, crazy. Guess what? You can get green gold today. Right? It's timing is everything. Green gold, there's a market for green gold. And that's changing the narrative because it doesn't have to be gold. It can be green, it can be blue, it can be purple. If there's a right time and a right market and the right design and all that. So we are mental alchemists in what we do and how we talk about foresight as much as we are futurists and foresight. So as I leave you for the next uh, day and a half and for COP28, I really do think, you know, please find your inner alchemist, right? Because our best futures, they need your magic. You need your magic like an alchemist. Thank you very much. It's been lovely to be here. <laughs>